Good afternoon. I apologize for starting out a little bit late, uh, but let's get through this and then Mark can start on his weekend. <laughs> Josh, you want to lead us off? Sure. Thanks, Eric. Uh, we learned this morning that the uh, DCCC was hacked uh, in addition to the DNC. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us if those two uh, breaches uh, were connected and also if you have any sense of how far this goes. Uh, does the, was the DSEC where you used to work, were they also involved in this? Do we know about other entities that might have also been, been hacked? Josh, I, I saw reports of that early this morning as well. I would refer you to the FBI for the scope of any investigation they are conducting. Obviously, they've confirmed an investigation into the uh, intrusion at the Democratic National Committee. I imagine those investigations are not conducted in isolation. So if there's uh, connected events um, that they would look at, that would be part of their investigation. Obviously, we expect that investigation to be thorough uh, and deliberate and look at all the facts and, and look at all the facts to where they lead. Uh, as I think you heard yesterday, our Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, uh, noted at a Aspen security forum in, uh, at a security forum in Aspen yesterday that they know that there's a sort of usual list of suspects uh, when it comes to malicious cyber activity. So they're looking uh, at those suspects, but at this point they don't have a public uh, confirmation to announce at this time. Uh, do you have any uh, updates about any diplomatic conversations that might have gone on with uh, counterparts in Russia or any other countries uh, about these concerns that we've been talking about this week? Uh, I don't have any update uh, or any additional conversations to tell you about. As, as I think we mentioned, Maybe yesterday, uh, Secretary Kerry uh, raised cyber activity with uh, his counterpart uh, when they had a meeting in Laos, I believe, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov. As I think Secretary Kerry uh, has noted, we've been concerned about Russia's activity in this space for quite some time. Uh, that Those concerns are, are well cataloged. If you look at um, even as recently as uh, early this week at a cybersecurity conference up in New York at Fordham University, the President's top Homeland Security Advisor, Lisa Monaco, mentioned that Russia has a troubling uh, past uh, in this space. Uh, Admiral Mike Rogers of Cyber Command, uh, in testimony just this past April, mentioned that uh, Russia has very capable cyber operators who work with speed, precision, and stealth. Uh, so we have long-standing concerns on this. Uh, Secretary Kerry raised those concerns uh, with Foreign Minister Lavrov. I suspect that won't be the last time uh, they have a conversation about this. Uh, and uh, this morning, the Florida governor announced that there were uh, four cases they've now found uh, of Zika contracted, they believe, from a mosquito within the U.S. Um, at the risk of uh, eliciting your whole spiel about why Republicans should have acted on this that we're very familiar with, um, does this particular development uh, trigger any uh, different type of response from the federal government, particularly are there any uh, travel warnings you're going to be issuing as far as pregnant women visiting that part of Florida or anything else like that? I won't take your uh, aspersion about my spiels personally. <laughs> Uh, but I will say the President was briefed uh, this morning on this uh, situation. This was part of his presidential daily briefing. And uh, the President has, of course, asked his team to keep him up to date. As you know, the President was briefed actually on Wednesday before departing for the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia. Uh, there was a briefing uh, led by his Deputy Homeland Security Advisor, Amy Pope. The President also had a chance last week to speak with uh, Governor uh, Scott about this uh, situation in Florida. And so he has, the President has directed his team to, to make sure not only the White House uh, and the appropriate federal government agencies are closely monitoring this, but also that we're providing uh, the resources and support uh, to the Governor that we can. I will give credit where it's due. Uh, Governor Scott has been preparing uh, for this circumstance for, for quite some time. They've had aggressive vector control in place to, uh, to limit mis transmission with mosquitoes. In this particular case, they announced that they've isolated the area, that they're testing aggressively, and that they're going to closely, uh, closely monitor this area in, in the coming days. They do this with the support of the administration. Uh, I think that the numbers the CDC has put out is CDC has given out $2 million to Florida uh, in Zika specific response. The CDC has also given out $27 million uh, in emergency preparedness, much of which can be used uh, for Zika response. But Josh, as I think you alluded to earlier, we believe that's not sufficient. 
that uh, Congress has been sitting on a $1.9 billion proposal uh, that would fund, more fully fund, uh, federal response to this public health emergency. Unfortunately, they left town for seven weeks uh, without doing anything on this. Uh, we find that regrettable. Uh, what's be we often get asked, what is not being done because Congress hasn't approved those funds? That includes everything from hiring more ins inspectors on the ground. This is something that local governments in Florida have asked for, yet uh, because Congress won't act, we're not able to su to supply enough funding for that. And also long-term study, uh, long-term international study. I believe the National Institute of Health has, ha has said they've had to suspend or they won't be able to complete a long-term study on the health impacts of this virus. That's unfortunate. And today's news should be a wake-up call to Congress to get back to work. Aisha. Uh, more on Zika. Um, right now, the CDC is recommending that women in areas where there's a Zika outbreak to kind of who are wanting to get pregnant, that they talk with their doctors um, and maybe and avoid mosquito bites and things of that nature. I was wondering now that uh, there does seem to be some local transmission, is there any planning or contingency planning or consideration of? Um, eventually, if the outbreak were to get bad, recommending that American women not get pregnant for a while or delay pregnancy or delay getting pregnancy in light of Zika if they're in the area hard hit by Zika? Well, Aisha, what we've said is that women should consult with their doctors uh, and not the White House press secretary uh, for personal health tips. But uh, as, as I think Governor Scott said earlier today, this does appear to be a local area of transmission. Uh, but public health officials aren't taking any chances. And so that's why the local officials have begun aggressive vector control uh, in this surrounding area. So they're gonna be testing uh, both mosquitoes and residents. Uh, that testing is already underway. They're gonna be closely monitoring this and they're gonna be closely coordinating with the CDC on testing uh, to see if there's any additional resources uh, that are needed. Again, when the president spoke with Governor Scott last week, he said, let's keep the lines of communications open. Uh, our principal channel for communicating with Florida on this has been through the CDC. Um, so I, I know that they conduct a lot of business back and forth, but the president wanted to make sure that uh, Governor Scott was getting the resources he needs, and that was a directive he issued uh, to his team here at the White House. Um, on Turkey, um, so some U.S. officials have said that the purges currently going on in Turkey uh, due to the failed coup are hurting U.S. cooperation with Turkey on the fight, fight against Islamic State. Um, uh, Turkish officials have kind of angrily rejected those that criticism and accused the U.S. of maybe being in league or some in the U.S. of being in league with the, the plotters of the coup. Um, I guess, uh, does, does the White House have any uh, response to that and also how concerned is the White House that these purges are affecting kind of the cooperation against the Islamic State? Uh, good questions, Aisha. And let me start by saying the U.S. has strongly and repeatedly condemned the failed coup in Turkey. We've repeatedly expressed our support for President Erdogan, and we've expressed our support for Turkey's democratic uh, elected government, um, that respecting the democratic institutions in Turkey is a guiding principle for us. Um, and that any speculation uh, that either uh, the U.S. Uh, was behind this or involved or aware, uh, as the President said on Friday, is completely baseless. So uh, we reject any speculation. Uh, and the President also said on Friday that, that sort of fueling that speculation uh, could impact our relationship with Turkey, that uh, right now we do have a close relationship with Turkey. The President considers um, uh, President Erdogan a close ally. Uh, we work together on a number of uh, the president's international priorities. That includes uh, our broad coalition to counter ISIL and ultimately defeat them. That includes, um, obviously, they're a NATO ally. So we have a lot of business we get done with Turkey. I will say um, they are, our work on our counter ISIL coalition uh, continues in earnest, uh, and, and that relationship continues to be strong. Obviously, our military leaders have a relationship with their counterparts in Turkey. That's how we're able to uh, work so closely together. So I know that our Defense Department has addressed this. Obviously, there were some interruptions in the intervening in the past week or so, uh, which is understandable, if you can imagine, uh, a, a, as 
the people of Turkey have been shaken uh, by what happened. Um, uh, the president has remarked that if a rump group of military officials here tried to stage a coup and flew planes and uh, tried to overthrow the government, it would shake us too. So uh, the president has been responsive to that, but he's also called for restraint in how Turkey responds. He's called for a strong and unabiding uh, fidelity to Turkey's democratic institutions. These are principles like freedom of expression, like freedom of, uh, of the press, uh, freedom to gather, freedom to protest, that part of the strength of, of Turkey is their respect for democratic traditions. These are principles enshrined in the Turkish constitution, and the president wants to make sure that respect for those principles continues even in the wake of this failed coup. Thanks. Michelle. Um, thanks, Eric. The EU has called what Turkey has been doing in the wake of the coup unacceptable. Um, some have even called it a purge, uh, that they have fired or detained tens of thousands of people. So why has the U.S. not spoken out on those particular actions? Is, is it because the U.S. does not believe that those actions are unacceptable, as the EU now does? Well, Michelle, I think uh, I draw your attention to the President's remarks on Friday. He made clear that we are concerned uh, by reports of, of the activities you're mentioning. The United States does strongly support freedom of expression around the world and has concerns when a country makes move to close down media outlets or restrict universal values. We respect the Turkish authorities to uphold, we expect Turkish authorities to uphold their assurances to the president um, and as they made to the public that they will protect the rule of law and fundamental freedoms. The president, uh, doesn't just believe this because these are freedoms that are American values, but the president believes these are democratic values and that Turkey has a long history of respecting these traditions. Uh, and even in the wake of uh, such a serious upheaval uh, that happened in the midst of their failed coup, that these values uh, need to be respected. But the president then doesn't think that what the government has been doing is unacceptable. Well, look, I think the Turkish government Turkish government was nearly overthrown in a violent coup attempt that left hundreds dead and public buildings damaged. So it's understandable that they're going to take some time to recover from that. But as they recover, the president has been clear, and he's been clear in public statements and in his private conversation, uh, that the government of Turkey needs to uphold the highest standards of respect for their own nation's uh, democratic institutions and the rule of law. That's going to be the best way uh, for Turkey to get through this. Okay, and um, did the president watch Hillary Clinton's speech last night? How, how much of, of last night did he actually view? Do you know? Uh, I know he uh, had the television on last night. I know he saw Secretary um, Clinton's speech. I know he saw uh, General Allen's speech. Uh, he remarked to a few of us at the White House how struck he was by General Allen's speech. Uh, he is obviously someone who knows General Allen quite well, uh, but he had not seen him uh, perform in that type of setting before. As you know, he uh, the president released a, a, a quick statement last night, uh, and he, he thought the speech was inspiring. Uh, there, I know there was a question yesterday whether or not Secretary Clinton was up to the task. Uh, that is, was never a question in the president's mind. Uh, the president, as he has said, believes that she's the most qualified individual to ever be uh, running for president. So uh, I think the speech echoed a lot of the sentiments we've heard over the past week, but also over the past years, uh, and from both the president and from Democrats across the board. There is an abounding sense of optimism. It was focused on uh, the forward promise of America. Um, we heard a lot of confidence in the American people, uh, and we thought, I thought the speech was quite forward-looking with a sense of pride uh, and a love of country. We heard a lot about building the economy from the middle class out. That is a deep-rooted philosophy for this president, but again, Democrats across the board, that the president believes that uh, the most, the strongest economy we can have in this country is one that builds the middle class out uh, and supports economic growth uh, for middle class families. And then lastly, I think one of the strong themes we have heard this week is that America is a stronger country when we are united and that uh, our biggest strength is our diversity. This includes different races, different backgrounds, different faiths. Uh, this is, I say this not because it's 
precisely the principle that has animated this president and throughout his entire career in public office, but also because we believe it's a fundamental American value that's uh, uh, part and parcel to this nation's identity. Okay, now that we're learning more about the hacking that's been going on, we're seeing another entity saying that they've been the victim of it. Whoever did this, what it looks like, according to officials, is a state actor that is trying to influence the election. Um, and that raises the question of the security of voting machines, electronic voting machines around the country. I and mean, that's something that's talked about every year. But given the, the timing of this hack, how concerned is the White House about that? And, and the fact that we're dealing with so many small jurisdictions that are managing the maintenance and security of these machines, are you taking any measures to try to safeguard this? Is that even possible? And, and how? Michelle, it's a good question, and I want to, uh, before I answer, make clear that the FBI is still investigating the intrusion that you mentioned. So I'm not going to be in a position to uh, get ahead of that investigation. Uh, so we're going to wait for them to make a determination uh, on the perpetrator and a determination if they want to make that uh, known publicly. But your question about the integrity of the United States voting system is a good one. That's one that the president takes very seriously. Uh, I don't have any updates in terms of uh, reviews or a detailed analysis of where that infrastructure stands. But as we've seen, uh, Russia in the past has tried to influence elections uh, uh, in Europe. And um, we take seriously their past record on this. And we also take seriously uh, the integrity of our voting system. So I'm not sure it's going to be fair to equate uh, in a cyber intrusion at a political committee with how elections are tabulated, but uh, the president's commitment to cybersecurity is one um, that has not waned. Uh, the president has made clear that this has been a priority over the past seven or eight years. Even in the short time of this presidency, we've seen the uh, technology develop in ways that might not, not, not have been anticipated back seven or eight years ago. That's why the president believes that our technology and our cyber defenses uh, need to be kept up to speed. That's why there was a big significant proposal in his budget this year. Unfortunately, Congress hasn't acted on that. Congress instead decided to leave town for seven weeks. Uh, they haven't even had a hearing on that proposal. So again, maybe when they get back uh, from their vacation, I mean their recess, they can they can uh, look at, take a look at this. Do you think this is something that the federal government will get in involved in and, and I don't know I, I don't know what can be done really but taking a look at this ahead of time because at the DNC and D and D triple C the security and resources that they have couldn't prevent a hack how is some small county with far less resources um, going to even notice that there could be some tampering is this something that you see the White House or the federal government getting involved in well, I think we should just separate out those two things because the DCCC and the DSCC are political organizations. They don't conduct any voting. Uh, voting is tabulated through those agencies. Yeah, so but I'm saying a big entity, and, and including the White House and, and others that have been hacked, they couldn't prevent it from happening. So we're talking about a bunch of voting machines in some county office somewhere. Um, how are they supposed to have the resources to even know that? a hack went on if it if it does. Well, again, the president takes this enormously seriously. At the Department of Homeland Security, we have teams set up to act as resources for any uh, agency outside the federal government that needs help, uh, that needs support. So sometimes that's the private sector, sometimes that's large companies, sometimes that is uh, uh, political organizations like the ones we're talking about, and sometimes that's other governments. Sometimes that is uh, smaller governments. So our that's a process in a, in a resource that's housed at the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, so we do want to make sure they're getting the resources they need. Thanks. Thank you. Angela. Following up on Aisha's question about Turkey, uh, you mentioned that there had been illusions of U.S. involvement in the coup in one way or another. But um, just today, President Erdogan specifically said that he thinks that the U.S. general in charge of the Central Command was involved or supportive of the coup. Can you directly address President Erdogan's assertion on that? Yes, it is entirely false. Uh, there, there's no evidence of that uh, at all. And the president made clear w when he spoke on Friday that there was no U.S. involvement and no U.S. awareness ahead of time. Uh, and speculation to the contrary is baseless. Uh, speculation 
along those lines, as the president said on Friday, is uh, risky because it puts our men and women who are serving in Turkey at risk. So we feel that um, uh, talk and speculation al along those lines uh, is not particularly constructive. It, it happens to not also be true. Uh, but what the president is focused on is making sure that Turkey uh, comes out of this time, um, begins to um, resume their normal practices, uh, understanding how an event like this can shake a society and a government. But that the best way to do that right now is to resume their uh, long-standing tradition and embrace of democratic institutions. You wrote out a call a few days ago between the president <coughs> and uh, President Erdogan. Has, have they had any opportunity to talk any further, and or are there any plans for President Obama to make a call now that this is a now for more days. I don't have any additional calls to read out. As you point out, the um, uh, president spoke, uh, ma made that call, uh, I believe, two weeks ago now in, in the wake of the failed coup. I would also mention that the United States was one of the earliest uh, countries to condemn the failed coup. We, in that statement, we supported uh, President Erdogan. Uh, we expressed support for the democratic institutions, the democratically elected government of Turkey. So um, those were sentiments that were expressed both publicly through public statements, but also privately uh, through the president's conversation with President Erdogan. And then finally, do you have any update on Turkey's request to extradite Mr. Gulen from, uh, from the U.S.? I, I don't have an update, Angela, other than to say that that is being assessed through the proper channels. I know that the Turkish government has sent over materials uh, for our officials to review as Josh has laid out and the president did on Friday, I believe, in that press conference, uh, there's a very specific channel uh, for this to be worked through, and that process is ongoing. So we're not going to be in a position to provide a play-by-play -play up here uh, with every crank. But if there's an update um, that's releasable, uh, we'll let you know. Thanks. Kevin. Thanks, Eric. I want to get the latest on Gitmo. Is it a reasonable expectation? that uh, another wave of detainees may be released in the next couple of weeks. And if that drives the number below, say, 60, for example, or even into the 60s, what does that say about the president's efforts to continue to empty the facility there? Well, Kevin, I think it's important to look back. You're always uh, rightfully asking for the current numbers. But if you take a look back at the beginning of this administration, there were 242 detainees at Guantanamo facility there. Today there are 76. So we are going to continue to work diligently to reduce the population. We do this We do this through safe and responsible detainee transfers. Uh, but I don't have any ones to preview for you at this time. As you know, when individuals are transferred, we will uh, publicly release that information. Okay. Uh, on Syria, I'm sure you are aware of reports today that uh, Damascus and Moscow are now allegedly coordinating and cooperating an offensive to, uh, or I should say an operation, uh, in and around Aleppo. What is the administration's perspective of this uh, alleged uh, partnership? Well, Kevin, the United States is deeply concerned about the situation in Aleppo. Over the last few weeks, Russian and Assad regime offensive has a, have effectively cut off the opposition-held parts of the city. This, is, this only exacerbates the humanitarian situation uh, by laying siege to some 300,000 civilians. Uh, the UN Special Envoy uh, has noted that there may only be weeks of humanitarian supplies uh, within the city. So we're taking a look at Russia's announcement of the humanitarian corridors, but given uh, their record on this, we're skeptical to say the least. Um, access to the city should be open to fully allow for unimpeded uh, humanitarian support and commercial traffic to Syrian civilians in their homes. Unfortunately, uh, Russia's involvement here is consistent with what we've seen from them over the past few months, which is instead of focusing on the threat posed by ISIL, they are instead choosing to prop up the Assad regime. We believe that's not only counter to the national security of the United States, but it's also counter to the stated goals of a political transition inside Syria. As you know, that's not only our stated goal. Russia has stated that as a goal. So by continuing to prop up the Assad regime, we're only delaying uh, the inevitable. So what does it say then about the overture from Secretary Kerry and the success or lack thereof? Well, I think that that is a conversation uh, 
that is happening with the goal of trying to strengthen the cessation of hostilities. Uh, I know that Secretary Kerry and his counterpart, Foreign Minister Lavrov, have been having a series of conversations. Those steps, if agreed and implemented, will not be based on trust. We'll be looking for specific actions by Russia that show the Assad regime uh, that show the Assad regime that Russia is going to fill, fulfill their commitments. Unfortunately, I think as you're getting at, recent actions throw a lot of doubt uh, into Russia's true intentions. So Russia is at a point where they're going to have to make a decision whether they want to continue to prop up the Assad regime, someone who we believe has lost the legitimacy to lead, uh, not the least of which is because he committed heinous acts against his own people. Um, so Russia can continue to go down that path, or Russia can keep to its word, which is they believe, which as, as they have said, the only way to solve Syria right now is a political transition. Are you aware, I, I presume you are, of airstrikes that may have claimed the lives of dozens of civilians in Syria? I understand uh, by way of our sources at the Pentagon that CENTCOM is looking into the possibility. What can you tell us about that? Kevin, you're right. Uh, I believe CENTCOM has issued out a statement on this. Uh, that um, says they're immediately going to look into this, and then once they retrieve their information, they'll see if additional action is necessary. I could speak for the president when I say that this administration and this United States government takes all measures during the targeting process to avoid or minimalizing civilian casualties or any collateral damage and to comply with the principles of law armed conflict. As the president has noted, uh, we cannot explain our efforts clearly and publicly uh, when we're not completely transparent. So we believe that transparency is not only consistent with our democratic ideals and principles, but it's important for the sustainability of our counterterrorism efforts uh, over the long term. Lastly, on ISIS, is it, is it your perspective that even though the ongoing uh, fight against ISIS in places like Syria and Iraq uh, continue to ramp up from the American perspective, and I've seen some numbers now where uh, it's been suggested by some of the administration that you're actually shrinking their footprint uh, by as much as 50 percent in some areas, for example, in Iraq. And yet it seems to me fairly clearly that it's beginning to pop up in other places and continue to spread. What's your perspective on that? And what, if anything, can you tell the American people who see this continued effort to fight and combat ISIS, and yet they seem to be everywhere? It's a good question, Kevin. We are tightening the noose around ISIL in Iraq and Syria. And we're working with our partners to close off the border to reduce the flow of foreign fighters in Europe. One of the president's uh, top goals in building the counter ISIL strategy and building a coalition which now exists of 67 members was to uh, shrink and ultimately eliminate the idea of a caliphate, a safe haven uh, for these terrorists. That was a uh, top priority. And uh, like you said, we've made good progress on that so far. I believe you're right. They have lost about 50 percent of the territory uh, in Iraq that they once held. They've lost a little bit less uh, in, in Syria, about 25 percent of, of what they held in Syria. But overall, this that's the result of the coalition flying over 100,000, uh, I'm sorry, uh, conducting over 14,000 airstrikes in Iraq and Syria. We've also trained over 25,000 Iraqi security personnel. Uh, and, you know, the president believes this is a, um, a tribute to the strength and determination resolve of our armed forces, but it's also due to the diplomatic work of our State Department, that we've been able to build a coalition of 67 uh, members, most newly joining would be Interpol, uh, to help uh, facilitate communication. Um, about this threat, and more pointedly to your uh, to your question, we do have a comprehensive strategy that includes dealing with the challenge posed by uh, foreign fighters as well as individuals radicalized by violence. That's principally uh, why we are so proud uh, and pleased that Interpol has joined the coalition. Uh, but so this flow of foreign fighters, it has been a concern. It's something we've talked about. It's something that remains on the top of the president's. Um, uh, mind when it comes to this, and we can we'll get to this in the in the week ahead. But the president's going to be convening uh, his national security team uh, on an update on our counter ISIL efforts, and I'm sure this will be discussed. Thanks, David. Uh, given what we saw in Philadelphia, um, is the president you know willing to uh, give up on TPP, considering the rhetoric on the floor of the convention, as well as some of the statements from the Clinton camp that she she wants wholesale changes before she would support any of this? 
Uh, the answer to that question is no. Uh, the president believes um, that the Trade Pacific Partnership is is uh, a good policy um, for uh, American businesses and American workers. Uh, he is completely understanding of the of the complexities around the politics of the issue, that previous trade deals have not lived up to the hype. Uh, that's precisely why he directed his negotiating team to insist on the strongest, most robust human rights, labor, and environmental standards ever to be seen in a trade deal. So the president's acutely aware of the politics around this, but that's not going to stop him from uh, getting this done. You, you've been saying that the White House has been consistent on that point, but and a lot of the agency heads from USDR to others have gone out, you know, talking about the merits. Uh, do you believe that it's getting harder, though, and more difficult in the climate, even among your own party? It does, that, I don't see a lot of progress in winning over skeptics within the Democratic Party. David, I'm old enough to remember uh, people in this room reading the last rights to trade promotion authority uh, about a year ago. And uh, that skepticism was well founded, but turns out because of the arguments made on the merits, Democrats and Republicans came together to get that done. So we do believe this argument is right on the merits. And at the end of the day, that's what's going to prevail because 95% uh, of the world's marketplace is outside of U.S. borders. So it only makes sense to make sure that American goods and services can be marketed and sold around the world. Secretary Clinton had not come out against TPA at that time, I don't believe. So now she's firmly and seems to be expressing, and her team expressing more skepticism of this deal and more adamant that she's not going to do it. With the, with the what's the administration's strategy from this point forward uh, in getting it passed then? And, and if the secretary, as her team has said, and she, I believe, has, has said uh, publicly she would not support a lame duck vote on this, if she's on that position, will you, will you still go forward uh, with a, a push in a lame duck? Well, you'll have to talk to Secretary Clinton about her views. Our focus has been on generating votes in the United States Congress, uh, both in the House and in the Senate. Uh, the playbook for that will be Trade Promotion Authority. Uh, that was an instance where Democrats and Republicans came together, again, against some odds that, or odds that some thought were long. But at the end of the day, the argument did prevail, and I'll tell you why. Because either we can write the rules of the road for trade, or China can. China, we know that China is already negotiating their own trade deal. And we also know that that deal is not going to have the labor, environmental, and human rights standards that we've insisted on. So you're right that this will be something that Congress has to contend with. And they can either cede that ground to China. The president believes that's the wrong approach, that we have the opportunity. We're in the catbird seat to write the rules of the road for trade right now. And we should uh, absolutely so do that. The White House be pushing for a lame duck vote very strongly? The president yeah. absolutely believes this deal should pass this year. Uh, final thing, uh, the president spoke, I think, or seemed to maybe spend some time backstage with uh, Secretary Clinton the other night in Philadelphia. Um, did, I don't know that that may be the moment for it, but I'm wondering, has the president been talking to her and her team specifically, try to get her to you know, support this deal? He once had you know, great support from her on TPP. Does he think that he can sway her, as, the, as he called her, sort of the standard bearer, the torch bearer now uh, of the party going forward? Uh, David, I don't have details of that conversation. They did have a few minutes to catch up. Uh, after the president's speech in Philadelphia on Wednesday evening. I think uh, there were a few private moments uh, f for them to connect. I think also Secretary, or Secretary Clinton's family was there too. So I doubt they had deep policy dives on, on any particular issue. But again, our focus is on generating the sufficient votes in the House and the Senate. Thanks. Julie. Thanks. Um, earlier this week, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's office put out a statement saying that they were dispatching their um, National Security Council chief uh, to come here um, with the goal of signing a new military aid agreement with the U.S. as soon as possible. Um, can you update us on the status of those talks? Are, is he going to be meeting with people at the White House, and do you guys anticipate that that will be finished next week? Uh, I don't have any meetings to announce at this time. I can tell you, though, that our national security staff does remain in close touch uh, with their Israeli counterparts regarding a new year a new 10-year memorandum of understanding on security assistance uh, with Israel. As we have long said, the Obama administration is prepared to sign a new MOU with Israel, which would include both foreign military financing funds and an unprecedented multi-year commitment of missile defense funding. This would constitute the largest single pledge of military assistance to any country in U.S. history. Uh, like Israel, we remain committed to upholding the funding levels agreed by the United States and Israel in the current MOU. Uh, including $3.1 billion uh, in funds in fiscal year 2017. So, you know, 
you can't tell us whether you think you're, it's going to be finished in the, in the near term. Again, I don't have any meetings to announce at this time. If we have anything next week to read out, we'll let you know. Thanks. Mark. Eric, when you say the um, developments on the Zika in Florida ought to serve as a wake-up call, are you calling on Congress to come back early from uh, its vacation, oops, I mean recess? Uh, Mark, I'm calling on Congress to get to work as soon as they find it convenient for them. That Convenient? Yeah. Uh, they had adequate time. I believe we sent up this proposal in February. Uh, they left town in the end of June. Uh, that was four months. They couldn't find the time uh, to get to roll up their sleeves and get to work. Uh, and we should review the facts here. This was an administration proposal that the president sent up, but it was informed by our nation's top public health experts. So this shouldn't be a partisan issue. This shouldn't be a Democratic issue. I don't think mosquitoes have partisan affiliation. Democrats and Republicans should get to work on a public health emergency. Democrats have been united in this, have been committed to doing this. Uh, the Senate on a bipartisan basis got together and did a $1.1 billion proposal. Uh, the House fell far short of that. Uh, and unfortunately, nothing got to the President's desk. But if this is a uh, public health issue, why not, why wouldn't the President come right out and say, Congress, come back, it's urgent, you ought to um, uh, deal with this now and take your vacation later? Mark, the President was calling this urgent back in February, and Congress still decided to do nothing about it. So uh, it's unfortunate that um, the Congress left town without addressing this, but we should also remember that the President reprogrammed a lot of money, a lot of federal funding uh, to address this in the wake of Republican recalcitrance. So we've done what we could, what we can. I outlined a number of things that are being stymied because Republicans continue to block this. Uh, but if they come back and get to work and get this done, then we can even provide more resources uh, to states like Florida and elsewhere. Dr. Fauci said this morning that NIH is getting very close to running out of the reprogrammed money. Does, does, is, isn't that further a uh, wake up call? Absolutely. Uh, we did what we could um, earlier this year to reprogram federal funds, take them away from projects like Ebola, which still pose a threat uh, to the public health uh, of the international community. Uh, but there's only, a f there's only a finite spreadsheet available of funds uh, that allow us to do so. So the, the keys here are sitting in with Congress, and they ought to turn them and, and un unleash, unleash uh, more federal funding. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Jan, welcome. Thank you. Um, okay, so you, I mean, have consistently made the case that, you know, the Senate uh, should, you know, as you put it, do its job and confirm uh, the President's nomination of Merrick Garland to the Supreme Court. So without making that case again, I just want to <laughs> look forward. I mean, if the they maintain the resolve, which sees really no signs right now that they're weakening there. Would the president hope or expect Secretary Clinton would renominate him if she's elected president in November? Well, Jen, it's not going to surprise you to hear that we hope it doesn't come to that. Right. Uh, the Senate ought to do its job. This, that's not something that the president believes. That's something that's enshrined in our Constitution. That's something that's. Um, uh, consistent with past precedent. It's also something that Republicans have called for. George W. Bush's Attorney General, Alberto Gonzalez, has called for this. Um, uh, other uh, prominent Republicans have said what uh, Leader McConnell's strategy, have called Leader McConnell's strategy misguided. So we absolutely believe that Republicans uh, have a responsibility to fulfill their jobs and get this done. Um, this is on their to-do list when they get back uh, from their recess. So uh, we believe that um, there shouldn't be anything that stands in the way. And you don't have to take our word for it. Independent uh, assessments of, of, of Chief Judge Garland have determined that he is one of the most qualified nominees ever to be nominated for the Supreme Court. The American Bar Association uh, reviewed his record and found that lawyers and judges uniformly praise the nominee with integrity. They interviewed hundreds of individuals in the legal profession who knew Judge Garland, whether for a few years and decades. Not one person could utter a negative word about him. 
if that type of search was done about me, I'm not sure they'd come up with the same result. So I believe that this is a unique situation and um, the president nominated someone who is unquestionably qualified for the job and the Senate should get to work and do, and, and do their job. But they, I mean, there's, they show no signs that they're gonna move on that nomination. So has the president had any talks with Secretary Clinton about this or would you expect him to uh, make the case for his nominee that she would renominate him if she's elected? The president's going to continue to make the case. Obviously, there's time when the Senate gets back uh, in the fall. The president expects uh, that the Senate should uh, confirm Merrick Garland uh, in this congressional term. But what, I mean, how, I guess what I'm trying to sense, get a sense of is how much would you expect him to go to bat for his nominee if the Senate doesn't? And it does then fall to, if Merrick Garland's going to be on the Supreme Court, it would be up to Secretary Clinton if she's elected. Well, the president has gone to bat for his nominee, will continue to go to bat for his nominee, and the president believes that the Senate is abdicating its responsibility by ignoring those calls. Um, and we, sh we should also point out, according to public statements, Secretary Clinton ha agrees with the sentiment uh, that Chief Judge Garland should be uh, confirmed for the Supreme Court. Uh, she has said that publicly before. Uh, so. You know, this is someone who comes to uh, this nomination with bipartisan support. He obviously uh, generated a number of Republican votes uh, back when he was nominated for the D.C. Circuit. A lot of several of those Republicans are in office today, uh, and you'll have to ask them why they believe he was uh, he earned their vote then, but not today. Just, there was a big voting rights decision out of the Fourth Circuit that's just come down. I haven't had a chance to look at it, but kind of coming on the heels of a decision on voter ID in Texas, um, does the president have any comment or what would his statement be in general on, on some of those? Sure. I haven't been able to see what you're talking about, uh, the, the specific case you're talking about, but I can tell you generally speaking that the president takes uh, access to voting uh, as a fundamental right. Uh, he believes that we should be doing everything possible to make it easier for people to vote, not harder. Uh, that's a position he's held consistently. Uh, that's something that our Department of Justice has advocated in the federal courts, but it's also a matter of policy to the president um, in ways that uh, uh, he has assessed that the United States government and the, this administration and states all across the country should be doing to make it easier for people to exercise uh, their democratic rights. Thanks. John. Uh, thanks, Eric. Um, back on Zika, Dr. Fauci says NIH is about out of money, but by our count of the original reprogrammed 589 million, there's still over 300 million of that available. So. Can you square his comments with, with that pot of money still sitting there? Uh, John, I would refer you to the Department of Health and Human Services for exactly where the money is uh, in, in the transactions. Um, obviously, the president has directed his team to do everything possible to make sure that we're deploying all appropriate resources to combat this. Unfortunately, that's been made harder because Congress has sat on their hands for the last four months uh, and decided to not do anything about this. Uh, we spent some time talking about Florida. I know that the junior senator from Florida, uh, despite uh, being of a different political party than the president, spoke out on behalf of the president's proposal. Unfortunately, we can't say the same for the House members uh, from the Republican Party in Florida. Maybe uh, today's announcement will be a wake-up call to them. Uh, maybe uh, the governor's uh, leadership on this would extend to uh, House members having the courage to come back to Washington when they get back to Washington to, uh, to, to fund this effort. Why not dip into that money sooner and faster now, especially given the four cases in Florida? Sure, John. I'm confident that the money has been dipped into, that uh, all available resources have been or are being deployed uh, in this effort. So. Uh, the president has made clear to his team to spare no expense and to make sure that we're doing everything possible. Thanks. Stephanie? Um, thanks for convention. President Obama tweeted a glowing review of Secretary Clinton's speech last night, but what are the president's overall thoughts about the convention this week? Uh, well, the president was uh, there for a short time on Wednesday evening. Uh, he enjoyed uh, his time there. Obviously, it was brief. Uh, there's a lot of, um, there's a big footprint when the president travels. So 
we didn't want to disrupt uh, the sort of security infrastructure in Philadelphia too much. And I'll also say that the president, uh, I believe he remarked on Friday on the heels of the Cleveland, Cleveland Convention, how proud he was of local law enforcement working with Department of Homeland Security officials uh, to keep the people of Cleveland safe. The same can be said uh, for the Philadelphia Convention. Uh, all too often, uh, when there's violence, um, uh, law enforcement uh, generate headlines are generated uh, when there's violence. But the president believes that we ought to give as much or more attention to law enforcement uh, when there's not violence and when things go right. And this was an instance where local law enforcement worked with Department of Homeland Security, worked with Secret Service to not only keep the convention goers safe and the principal safe, but also the people of Cleveland safe. So the president salutes uh, our law enforcement on the ground. And, and then beyond that, uh, there's a lot of pundits on the ground in Philadelphia who can give you their assessment of how the uh, convention went. Some of them are our former colleagues. Uh, many of them might be on the Acela right now, uh, but I'm not going to be able to offer a political assessment uh, from here. That works. Speaking of law enforcement, has the president been briefed on the two police officers in San Diego that were um, shot at night? Uh, I, I don't have any conversations with the president to read out. As you know, uh, this is violence against police officers is something the president has spoken out strongly against, uh, not only in recent weeks, but for his entire uh, time in public life. The president believes there's no uh, excuse uh, for committing violence against the men and women who wear the uniform, that um, these are law enforcement officials who put their lives on the line every day. Uh, they risk their lives to protect people like you and me, and the president believes that they deserve our respect. Uh, the president gave a speech about this uh, in Dallas two weeks ago now. Uh, he also spoke, he's spoken out repeatedly about how much respects, respect he has uh, for local law enforcement. So obviously our thoughts and prayers are with uh, the families of, of those who we lost, uh, and, um, and, and we'll be continuing to monitor the situation. Thank you. Goyal, I'll give you the last one. Uh, two uh, conventions or summits are going on at the State Department on uh, counterterrorism and also fighting against uh, ISILs. Uh, one is uh, more than 20 countries are representing that uh, uh, religious and ethnic minorities under ISIL, and second one, India-US uh, India uh, counterterrorism summit. So, where do we stand as far as uh, and what role? Uh, White House is playing in these conferences, uh, one uh, uh, between U.S. and India counterterrorism, and second, uh, ISIL. And most important thing is that where the ISIL getting money, it takes money to kill innocent people and the arms. Uh, Girl, I think you're you're talking about w one of the latest efforts um, in our anti-coalition and our anti-ISIL coalition. This coalition is now made up of 67 uh, partners around the world. The president's enormously proud of the coalition we built to degrade and ultimately defeat ISIL. Uh, that work uh, continues uh, at a at a fast clip and at a robust uh, level. So we have diplomatic efforts uh, in our State Department that are ongoing, and um, that's only one component of our work. Obviously, we're grateful uh, for Prime Minister Modi's contributions on this. Um, like you said, it's not just about diplomacy or about military action, but uh, it is about their financing. And that's why the President directed his uh, Department of Treasury to do whatever we can to cut off and chokehold uh, financing that streams towards ISIL. Our um, point person on this is an individual by the name of Adam Zubin. Uh, Mr. Zubin worked, uh, has worked for administrations of both parties. He worked in the George W. Bush administration, uh, and he's one of the very best at what he does. Unfortunately, his nomination is stuck in Congress. His nomination is one of uh, many things Republicans have, have failed to move on. In this one, is one they have not offered any explanation for. Uh, I know that his, his nomination has been pending for many months in Congress. We find that unfortunate. Mr. Zubin himself has said that when he travels around the world uh, in order to leverage our relationships to make sure that we are uh, doing everything possible to cut off financing uh, towards ISIL, that it's important that um, countries know that he has the president's back and that he f fully represents the United States government. And that's why we call on the Senate to confirm him uh, quickly. And second, uh, as far as uh, South China Sea is concerned, a very serious uh, situation in the region 
after Philippines won a case against China in the Hague. Uh, China doesn't agree with the U.S., it doesn't agree with the regional countries and those uh, claiming and uh, a serious matter there. And uh, um, President of uh, Singapore will be here on Monday, uh, meeting the President of the White House, if this uh, situation will be discussed with him because many experts at the think tanks are saying that that region of South China Sea may be a beginning of Third World War because China doesn't care uh, about those nations who are democratic and peace-loving nations. Well, Goyle, uh, appreciate the, uh, the pivot to the week ahead, which I'll get to in a minute. But uh, you're right um, that this is an issue that the United States has been focused on for some time. I can tell you that Ambassador Rice uh, was just in China uh, having several meetings uh, at, at all levels of their federal government uh, where this issue was raised. So our work on this remains unabated. And I do expect this to be a topic uh, to come up uh, w with President Long uh, here next week. Um, obviously, we have uh, deep economic ties with uh, the country of Singapore. Uh, they are a member of the TPP. Uh, and the president had a, had a very warm visit there back in 2009, right after he was elected. So the president did want to host uh, Prime Minister Long and Mrs. Long uh, here next week for a state visit. Is, uh, what you are doing as far as China's threat to these uh, small nations in the region as far as uh, South China Sea, that's the most important way. Uh, what, what message do you think President or uh, U.S. has for, for these nations? Our, our policy on this has been clear, Goyle. We don't take a position on any particular uh, territory in the South China Sea. Our, but what we do take a position on is these need to be adjudicated through international norms. So we believe that um, uh, that any sort of territorial dispute should be adjudicated through uh, the appropriate international channels. That's what Ambassador Rice conveyed uh, when she was in China earlier this week, uh, and that's what we've said consistently publicly uh, back here at home. And, uh, finally, U.S. is uh, um, in contact with India to put this uh, uh, resolving these issues, uh, as far as uh, because India is also one of the parties in the region, maybe threatened by China uh, or for, for the activities. I think they were in close contact uh, with the government of India. Pr uh, President Obama considers Prime, Mo Prime Minister Modi a, f a good friend. Uh, we, we've collaborated on a number of projects. Most recently, uh, and most notably, uh, the agreement that the United States uh, worked with India on. Uh, allowed for the Paris climate deal uh, to happen. And so the President's enormously proud of that work. He's also enormously grateful uh, to Prime Minister Modi for his work on that. Uh, but that's not the only facet of our relationship. Obviously, we have deep economic ties, deep security ties. Uh, so the Prime Minister, the President deeply values his relationship with Prime Minister Modi. Thanks, sir. Great. I will do the week ahead. On Monday, the President will travel to Atlanta to deliver remarks at the 95th National Convention of the Disabled American Veterans Group. The President believes it is our nation's sacred obligation to honor the servicemen and women who keep our country safe and looks forward to discussing how we can ensure our veterans receive the benefits they have earned, as well as continue expanding opportunities for our service members, veterans, and their families. The President, while in Atlanta, will also attend a DNC roundtable. On Tuesday, as we mentioned, the President will host Prime Minister Long and Mrs. Long of Singapore at the White House for an official visit and state dinner. President and Prime Minister Long will also hold a press conference at that afternoon. The two leaders will celebrate the bilateral relationship between Singapore and the United States that has served as an anchor for the United States' rebalance to Asia. On Wednesday, the President will participate in a Young African Leaders Initiative Town Hall at the Omni Shoreham Hotel uh, in Washington, D.C. in Woodley Park. On Thursday, the President will travel to the Pentagon to chair a National Security Council meeting on, counter, on the counter-ISIL campaign and receive an update from his national security team on the efforts to degrade and ultimately destroy that terrorist group. On Friday, the President will attend meetings at the White House. And on Saturday, the first family will depart uh, for some rest in Martha's Vineyard. Eric, Thank does the President have any plans for this weekend? Uh, we will let you know. Thank you.